success, we have to think about educating women. Educating them, empowering them, and then amplifying them. Who's we? Because I'm educated, honey. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm empowered. <laughs> Today on Anakoma TV, I get up close and personal with my good friend, Kesi Day Anosike. For you to sit there in your house with your smartphone, with your Wi-Fi, and say that people don't value their lives because they have come out to look for money, that will support their life. It's very easy and lucky to say that, right? right. It's very That's easy. And, that in exactly. Which it's so easy to miss. Kesi Day, or Kesi as I like to call him, flips the script on me and gets me to open up to talk about all things awareness, COVID 19, and of course, racial justice. Because I could not negotiate a truth. Like, I just felt like there are, there's a truth that I just refuse to negotiate with you. And I could not allow myself the pain of the possibility of them not understanding. Yeah, because that would always happen. <laughs> that would always happen. Would it's gonna be like, oh, I'm not racist. My, my best friend is black. Oh, I'm not racist. I went to Uganda last Christmas. Tune in to hear more about what our thoughts and feelings are about existing in the last quarter of 2020. So excited to be finally back on my trusted white couch with a conversation today with really just a very great friend, a beautiful mind. <laughs> Love this guy completely. Um, not only is he a great friend, but he's an amazing writer who is sitting today on my couch today. Now, this is going to be fun because Casey has promised to flip the script. And so I'm going to be given a chance to get super vulnerable with you guys. So... Yeah, hey super, friend. I'm super excited. Hey friend. How Thank are you. you? I'm great. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's so, you know, September, I listened to a podcast this week that said, said that September is our reset. Mm. But this year, we don't have the things that signal a new mm -hmm. year. Mm. So usually people are going back to school, whether it's university or college or, um, I'm trying to think. I don't watch football. So is there it's like... <laughs> no, but look at it. I was thinking about it this morning. They usually shows come back in September. Shows, shows like Grey's Anatomy. Exactly. And they're all just starting to film now, which means that they might not be out until October or next December spring, or right. next year. Who knows? Um, but it's also something that I've learned from this year is that nothing is real. Mm -hmm. I don't think that anything is real. Mm, yeah, normal, yes. Things are normalized, but things Think, are not exactly, normal. Exa exactly. Yeah. So the things that we have conditioned ourselves to think are normal yeah. are actually just conditioning, a form yeah. of conditioning. So I wouldn't have thought that there would be a time where the world would be in the place that it is right now. And you and I would still like sitting on the couch and talking and I would still be eating rice and people would still be drinking and people would still be dying. And I feel for me, what this year has been largely is an experience of what it means to abandon reality. Wow. And, um, and it's, it's something that I'm still processing, but it's also something that I would like us to unpack on this couch. And I will start with asking you, how has the last... Ooh, when was your last video? <laughs> and the last time we shot, I think, was the first week of March, and mm -hmm. that was it. So that's what, it's been six months? It's been six months. Wow. How has it been for you? Six if I'm being totally honest, there are entire swaths of the last six months that I don't completely remember. Yeah. I, oh my God, I have seen as well. Yeah. And it's probably a combination of things. There aren't any events to sort of like mark mm -hmm, the moment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also we're not registering faces. Mm, because of face masks and, pe you know, all the it's coverings. True. True. So I don't always remember who... I'm around. First of all, we're not around much, right? The moment we step out of this enclosed space that is controlled and, you know, selective of who comes in, we have face masks on. So we're not really registering. Yeah, I was thinking about that as well in terms of what this new normal has done with intimacy and intimacy yeah. that exists between strangers, yeah. which is largely what forms our interaction with the world. Right, you like know, eye it's like eye contact, how you back someone's lip, how you 
shake someone or how you just interact in a space with your buddy yeah. and other buddies. Um, and I've just been thinking that it's just, it's, it's, it's interesting what it's doing. And I think the, the results or the effects of this pandemic is something that would still resonate in two years, in three years. Like we've, we've experienced a shift in a lot of dynamism that we didn't think was possible. <laughs> you know, when, when this started, I used to tell people that I believe that this is the next stage of human evolution. I, 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 I agree with you. Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know it as it was happening, mm -hmm. but having lived through it and still living through it, I, I, I honestly believe that we, have, we are at the, we're at the, what do you call it? We're at the bridge of getting into something. And what that something means it's, it's unique for each person. Everyone's experience of this pandemic is unique, but it's also universal, I feel. Yeah. Because I will start with you. Mm -hmm. How, what has been your takeout, I want to say, with the world and how the world exists and how, like with humanity, I think. Yeah. What has been your own takeout in the last six months? What, have, what has struck you the most about the way we live our lives? Um... One, I've been incredibly proud of my country's response. Mm. Nothing's without problems, and this is not me trying to be naive, but overwhelmingly I've been proud of our government's response. Our president spoke to us every single week. There was something reassuring of knowing that the president was going to talk live on social media to tell us what the response was. Um, and it makes me proud to also see how Ghanaians are taking care, have taken care of one another in this process. How I've seen the pivot of everybody just responding to a national effort of companies that were making gin, making hand sanitizers, of government actually giving money for small scale businesses to support um, the effort. To see seamstresses just pivot their business to make masks the fact that we didn't go into a shortage of sanitizer or mask or toilet paper in this country that's supposed to be developing where like the other developed nations could not even, it, it was a whole conversation about should we get PPE, should we not? And also just to see how, how when you, I've seen how Ghanaians are taking care of other people where maybe right now masking is not as strict um, but I've seen how when you ask someone to wear a mask just to think about the other person, that's not seen as a new, like, not, it's not seen as a nuisance. Mm -hmm. I've fallen in love <laughs> again with, like, with being here all over again in Ghana. How long have you been in Ghana? Yeah. So I left Ghana at the age of nine. Mm. I moved back at the age of 25. Um, that was were back you in. Coming back in between. Or were you mm -hmm. okay. We were coming back in. So that's the part I skipped. Okay. Uh, we were coming back in between summers, Christmases, that sort of thing. Um, but those, you know, you're coming during summer, during Christmas. Yeah. People are taking off a week or two just to really accommodate the fact that you're in town and you're not going to be around. And um, I moved back in 2013. I was 25 years old and. Uh, <laughs> it's been a journey. It's been a beautiful, beautiful journey. It hasn't always been perfect. It's been very up and down. Yeah. But I realized that coming to Ghana or moving back, like if you are living in the States or grew up in the States like me or if you're in the UK, uh, right now because of coronavirus, a lot of people <laughs> are thinking about moving back home. Yeah, I was going to say that another... another um Another shift, Dyna yeah. another change in yeah. dynamism. I think is just how much the third the the third world countries have it better than the first world countries. Oh my God. I was going to ask if your relationship with your phone has changed since COVID. I probably spend more time on, mm. but then last month I was completely not even looking at my phone. I was the opposite, like, I was the complete opposite. I was losing I wasn't a mind. much phone person. Ah, okay, okay, makes sense. Yeah, I used to be, the, I'm the type that can shut off my phone for three weeks, but yeah. Yeah, I, complete opposite, because I feel like when, because I rely on the phone a lot for my news, because I don't watch TV, 
so I have all of these apps that give me breaking news and I have like my subscription apps, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, E2C that I like to read on. Uh, but I realized that at the start of this pandemic, so okay, not the start, maybe towards the middle, so maybe March, April, May, I think May was the time that I was just completely over it. Yeah. It was just too much. There was an unbearing sense. Oh my gosh. Sense impending of, doom. Just impending doom and sadness and just it was gloom, 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 gloom everywhere I turned. Yeah. So it's just having to engage with all of what was happening at the same time. It's, it was too much for me that I literally had to end my subscription across so many, so platforms, many platforms because I, I, I couldn't exist in what I was existing in. And I was Melancholy telling people, definitely yeah, started I, creeping in for me yeah, as well. I was telling people yeah. that there was a sense in which I, was, I felt like I was living in fiction. <laughs> I felt like everything around me was... You're such a writer, gosh. <laughs> no, but it's also, it was also very um, difficult for me to write. It, it's been a very difficult year for me in terms of writing. I have not been able to write as much as I would love or as much as I usually enjoy writing. Because I felt largely clueless about so many things. I write to engage a feeling. I like I write to understand a feeling. But being trust in a situation where everything no didn't make sense. I, I I what am I investigating? What am I trying to engage with? Like what is happening? Would the world still exist in two weeks, in three months? Who cares about heartbreak? Who cares about like what are we supposed to care about? Because we were being offered something that we have never experienced before and we didn't have any tools to negotiate, any tools to navigate what we were feeling. So I was very, very overwhelmed. And I was like, you know what? I, I, I don't want to do this. And cancel, cancel, I, I, cancel, cancel, cancel. I'm going, to, I'm going to leave. I'm going to try to leave instead of trying to survive. Because what it felt like was that I was trying to survive. And I was like, you know, it's too much pressure. Reading that this was happening and that was happening and this person was dying and that was happening and there were all the, there was so much happening back home in Nigeria as well. Um, Should I mourn? Who do I mourn? You, exactly. Am I being selfish by mourning this situation, <laughs> exactly. but not that situation? Yeah. Am I being selfish by? Like how do I divide my? How do I divide how my do I, emotions? How do I express? How do I feel? I love what you said. How do I divide my devotion? Yeah, like, because I think that that is a ve- like before. Th- we started recording. We talked a little bit about like, I think it's time for us to really fully understand that we are going, like, there are several neurological effects and events taking place all at the same time. Yeah, you call it the behavioral economics. It is a behavioral, <laughs> right, in this yeah. sense, psychology, yeah. but like, it's neuroscience. Mm-hmm. What you're experiencing is actual neuroscience. When you can't explain what is wrong with you, you fall into melancholy. It's actually um, the term, you know, Freud, I guess, has like this book or document called sort of like mourning melancholia. And mourning it basically describes this idea that like you lose something, you're grief stricken, mm. but you get over it. Melancholia is when you don't. And part of the reason what sort of exacerbates not getting over things is that one, sometimes you don't know what's happening. So it's kind of like in, it's happening in the mm-hmm. background. You know, how, you know how your phone runs an app in the background? It's running in the background and then it sort of presents itself in full expression or you don't have the words or you live in an environment that's not, that does not like enable, n- enable you to talk, you. support you yeah. to talk about things. And so what ends up happening is that you live in this constant state of mourning. And I do believe that the last six months, not only has there been a lot to mourn, but there has been less words to describe exactly what it is. I agree with you. We've been grief stricken. We've lost mo- normalcy. Yeah. It's a loss. It's it's. But we haven't got a chance to bury it. We haven't got a chance to. And we to never it. mind. And that's and that's something that also breaks my heart because I don't think that people are processing what we have experienced or what we yeah what we have experienced and what we're experiencing. But what are you even processing? That's just the the, the shift. Yeah, but can you even name the shift? What is it shifting towards? What were you even shifting from? It's shifting from routine. I suppose I speak from someone who is like extremely routine. Okay. I know that having to readjust to, and this sounds very trivial, but it's also very important to a lot of people. For me, having to readjust to um, just working from home. That's me. It was, it, was, it was incredible for me because I am very routine. I like to segment my life. I like to church and state my entire life. Yeah. And for me, the ability to close my computer at work and say, okay, I'm done and I'm going home 
was what saved me. It was what allowed me kind to come home, make dinner, read a book, sleep. But the endless, and the endless <laughs> running time of I'm working, I'm eating, I'm exactly. napping, I'm Netflix, and I'm working. Or I'm, I'm eat- never not working. I'm never not working. You know, and that's... I feel like we even had less time off working from home because exactly. the expectation was your home. Exactly, and that is the thing. But that's part of the conversation that not many people are having as to how this changed our lives, especially people who are subordinates, especially people who have to report, yeah. and who are under extreme pressure to perform and to deliver because they are working from home. It's like the only advantage you have is that you're working from home. Okay, go and figure it out. You're working from home. No, you're working from home, Or people yes. who couldn't really see, like, you know, the affluent class has gotten so used to this supportive class of, like, okay, housekeepers, drivers, whatever. Know, and then it's like, okay, during lockdown, it's like, oh, I'm comfortable in, like, my mansion. I know. I don't expect you to go home. <laughs> That is something that also struck me in the last six months. Just yeah. how, um, I wouldn't say also, because I've always been aware of it. I try to have it as a consciousness that yeah. the world exists. There's a class system that in which we operate from. And it cuts across, like, literacy, wealth, gender, like, anything that, that, that there's, essentially, there is a divide. Mm-hmm. And what this pandemic has done is that it has highlighted just how unfair and ridiculous that divide is, and how much understanding is needed to bridge that divide. I remember back home in Lagos where, um, I want to say this was after the lockdown was eased and banks started operating, and there were images of people that crowded the bank on the first day, like when they resumed on Monday, right? So, I don't know, I want to say 200 people were trying, literally, it was... One of those Twitter pictures that went around. And I saw a tweet from someone who had a lot of followers who said, oh, Nigerians are so foolish. When will you think about your life? I'm, not, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, so I'm not quoting the person. But things around shaming, basically. And I saw that tweet and I was like, something about this doesn't sit right with well. me. So I read it again and I realized what it was. I read it and then I looked at the picture. So the people in this, in the, picture, the people photographed are not people who have access to like bank apps yeah. or internet or banking or Wi-Fi or smartphones. These are people who need yeah. to queue to use the ATM to remove like, what, 500 naira, yeah. like basic money yeah. that they need to eat. Yeah. So for you to sit there in your house with your smartphone, with your Wi-Fi and say that people don't value their life because they have come out to look for money that will support their life. It's very easy and lucky to say that, right? Like, it's very easy. A and, in that in exactly. Which it's so easy to miss. And that's what this pandemic has revealed in that there are a lot of people who don't recognize even the privilege of having a job. But even me and us and like I, I'm, when I went, when we went into lockdown, there were a few people who were messaging me and saying that, Nana, I, I just feel very, very anxious. I'm going through a lot. People had to return to abusive homes. Exactly. People had to like, I know people who had to literally go back to parents who abuse them and like go back to their homes and be in there. And like me and my husband don't have kids. We live in a very nice part of the, the city, um, a very secure part of the city as well, yeah. right? Like, exactly, because what was also happening in places is that people were looting. Yeah. <laughs> people, were, people who were, didn't have money, didn't they, have they money. resorted they to stealing, resor- they were looting. They resorted to, you know, fending for themselves however they could. And you're absolutely right in the fact that it revealed the pocket, you know those pockets of growth? Yeah. Because, you know, you're like, oh, I'm so intellectual. I done read all the books. I go to therapy. I know what's uh. Then you're like, oh, actually, th- th- that. It's very easy. We're all human beings. So we all have blind sides. Exactly. Like, so it's very easy for us to sleep and think that, to say that kind of thing. I remember because I was one of those people who were very vehemently against people not respecting, like, six feet apart, mask, wash your hand. I was like, oh, just do it, just do it, just do it. It was until you that tweet, I was able to confront that. One, I have the privilege of literacy. That's, that's the starting point. The fact that I could read, understand, comprehend, and enact, that is a privilege. That's the point. That's, so that's something that I, 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 just, I just took for granted. I was like, yeah, everybody should know that, hey, wash your hand, wash it with, for 20 seconds, hey, wear a mask, oh, don't stand too. People don't know that. So that's, that's, that's how, that's, that's one of the things that this pandemic has made me confront. Real is that we have so many blind sides to the kind of privileges we have. And privilege is not just one thing. 
right? Privilege is not just that. Dynamic. Yeah. And it's constantly shifting. It's moving, right? Yeah. It's like, it's not just that you have money or that you are male or that you're white or, I mean, all those privileges exist, but there's also the literacy privilege, which is something that, you know, has proven to be so valuable in this moment of our lives. Another privilege that for me, I can identify in my life is that like my husband works in government. And so I know when things are going to happen before, during, uh, during the lockdown. You have access to you information. You have access to information. <laughs> yeah. Consistent information. Yeah. Hey, I asked him about this issue, this issue. Okay, what testing center should I go to? Oh, this one is faster than that one. He has the data. He has the results. And he's able to tell me, and I'm able to tell my family and my friends yeah. how to go about it. And so we're able to weave through the system because really, privilege is information. Privilege is access. Right, yeah, you know, and so it's like be having enough information to know how to access. That's even step one, or being able to like even access that information. Right, like it's yeah. there's just so many things that we had to confront during that period, and I think for me that was absolutely one of them. There was a lot of judgment put on people for deciding to go through things a certain mm-hmm. way, and I'm like, yeah, I consider my ivory ta- my literal ivory tower, and say that. Right. And actually say that. Yeah, but it's also negating the fact that people are on the other end of the, ex- of the spectrum who are experiencing completely different things, you know. And it's now important for us to have conversations that bridge that divide. Yeah. Like in terms of educating people, but also not just educating people, empowering people, but also not just empowering people, amplifying voices, amplifying people's efforts. So there are three levels. You educate, you empower, and then you amplify. Because one can function without the other. If you educate someone and just leave them, like what are they going to do with that education? You need to empower them. And once they feel empowered, then you need to amplify their efforts. You need to say, okay, look at all these three structures that we have been able to work with. And then we need to sit this we need to sit these things against different sectors. How do you define empower? There's something because I, I the reason I'm asking this because I, I wanna I wanna I wanna have a conversation around the word empower because I personally don't believe I can empower someone. I believe I can sort of move. You know, the are you things. aware that you're empowering someone by engaging in this conversation with you? I believe that people on their own are powerful and I'm just giving the information. So that's why you're not powering them, you're empowering them. Hey. So, so powering so empowering, <laughs> and empowering. No, no, what I'm trying to say is that it's like you're not powering them, you're empowering them. Empowering them means that you've already acknowledged that they do have some sort of power oh, on their own. Right. So, and it's also in that you can use it as, I can only empower you, I can power you. It's like, I think it can, it's, it's very, it, you can dualize that it. That sounds wordy, friend. <laughs> no, no, you, very wordy. No, no, but you can dualize it. Because I used to think too as well. And I still don't think that I can empower, empower someone, someone. But I'm also someone who writes. I'm also someone who engages with the world through fiction. And through obviously nonfiction, but I, I'm aware that there's a sense of um, um, responsibility that I have when I approach a story or right. a piece or whatever it is that I'm doing with words. So I'm aware that there's that, that there's that responsibility, and it has a tool. So before I used to think, yeah, I can empower you because I don't think also that you can empower some. I'm confusing myself. What I'm trying yeah, to say. I'm like, really? No, no, hold on. What I'm trying to say, I'll get there. What I'm trying to say is that I, I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. The, the people, people are powerful, but on people their own. People are powerful. And also, also people, people wouldn't make decisions except they want to make decisions. There's only so much you, Nana Kanama, can do. There's only right. so much I can do. The, the last decision is on the person. Right. You can put guideposts in the way. Or so, empowering, the space. so empowering is these things. These things that, that you have mentioned, the space, this, things literally, along. these are the things that empower people. So when they come out to say, okay, yeah, I want to walk that path, they've come out, they're not seeing obstacles, you've cleared, Inanna Kanama has already cleared the road, and this person has made the decision to come out, and then they're facing a very clear road, they can walk. So you have empowered them by literally the most simple things, shifting this post aside, making sure that the world is tiled. You haven't told them, come out of your house, come out of your house, come out but of your house. Is that really empowerment or is that just like creating space to reveal one's power? Because that's, that's what empowerment means? Literally, that's what I'm telling oh. you. The power already exists. Because I, I feel like... Now, I feel like now, creating space to reveal one's power. The power already exists. The power is in the conversation. Your we can go on and on on this. <laughs> because I, I also kind of see that as like, the real power is saying yes. So if like you, the person, you're not saying yes, I can clear and clear and clear. And that's, that's literally where the job with empowerment stops. 
literally, that's the job with empowerment. Oh, I feel like such a scholar. Educate, <laughs> empower, and amplify. Love, okay. so when, <laughs> give, give me a program, okay? Casey said, I'm giving you a program. So when you, when you decide to educate someone, you have told them, these are all the things that can happen if you walk this path, right? When you decide to empower someone, you clear the road for them to, to you know, to, to right. do. You do the guidepost. These are all, you make it easier. So in both ways, in both things, it's the responsibility is just on you. It's left to the person to one, listen to that edu education, mm -hmm. two, take advantage of you having empowered them and walk that path. And that's when you will now amplify their efforts. And that's why amplify, amplification is very important. If they eventually step out of the room and walk their path and they get to the end of the world, you who has educated them, you who have empowered them, you owe it to them to say, yes, congratulations. You have done it. That's amplifying their voices to say, okay, you were able to achieve this. This is what this person was able to achieve. Does that, that make sense? sense? Yeah, it kind of does. But uh, so my, a lot of brains are being activated. So the, the public health researcher brain is, is coming up to say that, okay, like within that mixed, wh where, how do we have to be careful about paternalism and maternalism? How much of like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so I come from an international development background where uh, Western programs just tend to be very paternalistic and maternalistic, where it's like these ideas come and say, oh, no, Africans live this way. Mm -hmm. So like you also have to be careful that you're not also imposing sort of like your beliefs of how life should be in someone else's experience. And I'm just curious to know sort of like where in your three step program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing. So there's no place in which force is there's is force doesn't enter the room. You know, there's no imposing. I don't know that there's any imposing when you educate or when uh, you empower. So the framework has to be first of all, right? So for me, I'm saying the framework has to be first of all defined. So it's like you enter a world, the world in which we live in. Does we don't what we this is what we leave at the door, right? So within the world of educate, empower, amplify. To, to come into that room, this is what we leave at the door. We leave judgment at the door. We leave uh, paternalistic mm -hmm. attitudes, savioristic attitudes, bigotry. bigotry at the door. We leave hatred at the door. We sh tribalism and yeah, you know to, to contextualize. Oh, we leave all the bullshit ass isms Outside. at the door. Sexism. And then you come in. And then we come in. Because look at it now. When we talk about gender, for example, which is one of the most very I'm very very peculiar about um, talking about gender. I'm a feminist. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about gender, for example, right, so we look at all these steps in which I have, my, this is my program that I have defined. If we apply it towards gender and how we can progress into a future where sexism doesn't exist, we have to think about educating women, educating them, empowering them, and then amplifying them. Who's we? Because I'm educated, honey. Uh, okay. I am I'm well. empowered. <laughs> I'm amplified. And you did a fantastic job with what you do and how you support women and how you just, you know, essentially you support them. You mean in them. terms of, like, but I feel like the education is more for men to know. I agree. I think education in both ways. I think that women right. could be sexist as well. I think, yeah, yeah, I think you can also, yes. I feel like you can experience um, hostility and still be a vessel for hatred. I don't think that it's mutually exclusive. You, you can, can be both oppressor and oppressor. Exactly. Yeah, right? You can be the, the same thing. You could be the devil all at once. Um, so when I say we, I think both everyone, it's men need to be educated. Women as well need to be educated um, because we exist as a... We, socialism, so our socialization defines a lot of our thinking patterns. Right, and if you grow up in an environment that has told you women can be only one thing, and this is as a male or as a female, if you grow up in a place where women has been de have been defined as one thing, you would tend to see them as one thing only, and that's where we all come in. We as men and we as women, we as men and we as women. You know, come in. I, I had this conversation that, uh, with my husband, a similar conversation with my husband this morning, and I was asking, I was, we were talking about something specific, something he identifies with, and I said that this thing that you identify with. How much of it is where you were born and what family you were born into? He's like, oh, maybe like 40%. The other 60% is that it serves my interest. I was like, I would say 100% <laughs> that it was where you were born and the family you were born into, right? Like, maybe it's not 100 Like, I was obviously also, being... How would you, you define that it's 100%? That was me being, like, facetious because I feel like my husband... 
Um, I wanted to like humble him a little bit, <laughs> but he uh, obviously it's not 100 percent. But I was like, it's actually a lot more. It's probably more if you were really going to quantify it, which is a very difficult thing to quantify. Mm-hmm. And the, the research was not very clear how much nature, how much nurture. They just know that nature nurture mm-hmm. kind of works together. But I do know that a lot of our political beliefs, uh, where we stand on certain issues, a lot of times we literally usually told the line based on where you're born, who your family is, that sort of thing. Most of us, right? Unless we completely come in contact with the different political ideals and there's a, there's a, that's a whole other process of politicization. But it kind of comes back to what you were saying. Like if you have known something to be true, you're just going to accept it mm-hmm. as truth. And I think during this period, um, I realized, that I had actually stopped engaging with a lot of my white friends. Because I could not negotiate a truth. Like, I just felt like there are, there's a truth that I just refused to negotiate with you. And I could not allow myself the pain of the possibility of them not understanding. Yeah, because that would always happen. <laughs> that would always happen. That was too much. It's going to be like, oh, I'm not racist. My, my best friend is black. Oh, I'm not racist. I went to Uganda last Christmas. I'm oh, I'm not we racist. So I sent we money cool. to Tanzania. Me. <laughs> Understanding tokenism and how, what the role tokenism has played in my own life. And being like, it really started around 2017, 2016, 2017. I'm sorry, don't you just hate that fucking bullshit? <laughs> like, it gets on my nerves. I've experienced it so many times, but I, mean, I feel like I still have the same... You so much, and yeah. I just can't... I can't do it with you. I cannot negotiate my existence any longer. I am the original woman. I literally... Like, I am the original woman. The black woman literally... The African woman literally is the first woman to exist. And I remember... I watched, you know, if you know Henry Louis Gates and he does the, he did a profile in Lupita Nyong'o and was like, she possesses the Eve gene. Her mitochondria literally goes back to the first woman, the first homo sapien. And for me, the fact that in this world, a Lupita Nyong'o has to negotiate her beauty, her existence. It's know, wild. It's wild. It's wild. It's, it's, it's wild. It's part of the things that have made me just think that you know what? I, I I'm taking a, a break. I'm taking I'm steps. Taking a break from life. Just, not life, but like <laughs> no, but not life, but just from the conversation. From the from the conversation, I I want to leave it there because I think the more Same. I think about it, and the more that I engage with it, it, it it not only becomes more pointless, but it becomes more absurd. annoying and more absurd. Yeah. And I I want to scream and I want to break things, and I I live in a nice house and I don't want to break things in that house. So <laughs> so you're so so this reminds me a little bit what you're talking about is you know. Uh, Post World War II, mm. sort of like the absurdist movement, um, the theater of the absurd, mm, yeah, yeah. existentialism, this idea that, you know, so all these writers and poets who were like, actually, we just fought an entire war um, about nothing. That's usually what war is about. War is just men in it, unable to assess their, assess their egos. <laughs> and, and, and when you were just talking, I just thought, thought about. Um, and so that's what, that's where the idea of, of satirism and existentialism and of course absurdism be- begins to sort of show up. You have books like The Stranger and, um, Ionesco ry- Rhinoceros and Samuel Beckett and all of that. And what you were talking about for me signals a little bit of that. Mm. It's either we can completely check out or we begin to talk about the nature, the absurd nature of all of this. What do you think that we're? What do you think we're facing? Which option do you think that we're going with right now in the world? It's difficult to tell. If it's difficult to tell, <laughs> it is difficult to tell. Because I asked the question, I was thinking about the answer as well, and I was like, Damn, "I'm not is, clear." I'm not clear. So. <laughs> because in order for that level of absurd, absurdism to sort of be accepted, we have to be at least be willing to be vulnerable about the issue. And vulnerability requires humor. Mm-hmm. If you can laugh at yourself, but I don't think we're at a place where we can laugh at ourselves for how mm-hmm. ridiculous we've been. Yeah. And it makes me makes me sad. I was going to say it makes me mad, but it does make me sad that we are ex- we are essentially surviving a pandemic as the human race, and 
through it, there's still people who have it in them to be hateful towards and like other. of all the things you could do <laughs> right now. We are living through history. We are literally people are a, still a blaming back. people. Still like <laughs> this is literally a spot on like we are fighting against an invisible thing. force, right? And instead of instead of focusing on that, there are still people who have it in them to, to focus on the other or the, create the other to create the other and then to just hinge on why this other is everything that they are not. They, they, they are not. It, 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 it's, it's something to unravel. It's something to unravel and it's what makes me unsure as to what direction we're going in terms of what you just said. What's next? What's next? Because I, for me, it's like, if we're not changing, if this pandemic is not changing us, yes. changing yes. how we view yes. ourselves, how we view our brothers, our sisters, how we just if this pandemic isn't making us more tolerable, not making us being able to um, just recognize our shared humanity and to act on the fact that, yes, we are different, but we are so similar. Let me offer something for that. Mm. I think that, evolutionary speaking, mm. early humans had to... Um, this is part... This is, this is, this is a... a it's, this has been left behind from early civilizations um back when you didn't have antibiotics and and whatever the case is um you literally had to like ostracize people just to protect the common good like the complete good right like if one person was sick <laughs> and that was like you literally had to ostracize someone and there was, a there was, you know, that was, imp but that was important for, for literally mm -hmm. the survival mm -hmm. for us to, me and you have this conversation, somebody, some, excuse me, say your Igbo, so some Osu has been left somewhere. Yeah. That is, that is really, you know, so taking it a, a few steps back, I was, uh, once again, I was into another podcast and it comes that, you know, if in group psychology, it's remnants of, of sort of. I don't want to use the word primitive, but it's remnants of sort of like our evolution where if we're in a group <laughs> and it's hard, okay, we have to run away from saber tooth tigers. We have to literally forage for everything that we need. We need to hunt. Like we don't have Tesco's or like was a shop right or whatever to buy stuff from, right? If you, if one person does something that jeopardizes the safety of the group, shame was an important way to let the person understand mm -hmm. that this cannot happen because we are wired for group engagement. Now, uh, as we've grown, as we've evolved, humanity or humanness has required other things. And one of the most important areas of human existence is human adaptability. Yeah. We are wired for a lot of things. We are wired for group, but we're also wired... Um, to blame, we are wired to scapegoat. Yeah. It's very human. It's it's very fascinating that we we exist in a state of human conditioning. We it's human conditioning. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's also a decision. Like I said, remember, like we can decide the direction which we want sort of human evolution to go into, and we can decide. Like self reliance has been a thing, right? Group group think has been, you know, so we can decide that we want to be more inclusive, that we want to create systems of belonging. That's a decision we need to make. But I also want to sort of like offer sort of like a scientific backing for why some people still feel like they need to exist in a place where they have to create another. They're relying oh, yeah. on something. Oh, yeah, right? 100%. So how do, we, how do we get past that? So now we know this, and all of this have informed how we've been leaving. How we are leaving is not sustainable. How do we get into a point where, like you said, we have created systems of belonging, yeah. which is more which is more sustainable, which is more inclusive, which is more uh, more humane, which makes more damn sense. <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, what we also have come to learn mm. as as humans is that we are wired for group for a reason, mm. because literally better together. Yeah. Over time, we've become clearer and clearer to understand that. Oh, actually. Not only are we better together, but when we're together, it's nice that we all don't look the same. 
Yeah. There's some value. As time, as, like I said, it's a shift in human evolution, right? So at first it's, we all need to look the same because you can't trust the other. Then it became, actually, we're fighting forces bigger than us. So it makes sense to sort of like integrate because all of us are dealing with the same forces. And every step of the way, but every step of the way, there's also someone who's against that integration. Um, so the important thing is for us to keep drumming into one another's minds that over time we have come to understand that we're better together, but the more mm. we create a larger group where there is no in-group or out-group, then we're really harnessing all of human... There's so many obstacles to that understanding. Like, it's like the Tower of Babel. If you, you know? <laughs> a little Tower of <laughs> Babel. Babel. Because there's so many obstacles to that. There's cultural obstacles, there's traditional obstacles, there's so many systems that are working against this sort of inclusivity. Mm -hmm. And we also need to address the systems while we're addressing the topic in itself. Do you understand? So it's one thing to say that, yes, we need to make systems of belonging and we need to exist and we need to have a, 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 a sort of dynamic. But let's schedule. talk about the things that get in the way. Let's talk about the things that get in the way. Let's talk about the structures. Let's talk about religion. Let's talk about, you know, there's so many important conversations that I feel like we should be, that we will have to be having to get there. Now, the challenge is that people are not having those conversations. So it's not, I don't want to say that it's our work, because I don't want to put that pressure or that burden on anybody. Uh, artists, but that exactly, as artists, it's, yeah. it's our responsibility to make people see, to show them this is a way of living that, that is sustainable, that is healthier, that is, that is better. This way of acceptance, of inclusivity, that's, that's where you should be at. So that's what we do. That's what I do. That's what I strive to do with my writing. I always tell people that I write to make people feel less alone. And it's something that has always fascinated me because I didn't, I never started up thinking that I was a writer. I came into, <laughs> you know how we think we all come into the idea of our blackness when we get to the US or where we yeah. travel, right? For me, I came in, I didn't know that I was a writer. I sensed, no, that's not, a, that's not true. I literally did not know because I thought that everyone did that. I thought it was very normal for people to have this sort of thinkings and to feel with words. But um, obviously, much later in um, high school, I got into writing. But the, the underlining message I've always carried with me anytime I approach the paper to make someone feel seen, to make someone belong, to make someone feel... Um, visible, you know, and we were talking about it earlier with the work that you do in yeah. terms of visibility yeah. and just, I think it's powerful. I think when you, when we as writers, and not just writers, because I'm excluding people just by seeing writers, when citizens of the world, when yeah. everyone Makers. make that conscious decision to include another person in what it means to be alive, in what it means to live a life, then we can do so much more. We can do so. Confirming. We just, yeah, just it's confirming, reaffirming someone else's existence. Once, once we start to do that, once we are able to contextualize that we could be that person, it's just X Y Z that differentiates us from them. But at the end of the day, we feel pain. We all feel love. We all want to be cared for. We all want to be a unit. We all, no one wants to be alone. So let me ask you this question: Where to next? Um, we're in the. We're approaching the last quarter of 2020. People are talking about 2021, but nobody's entirely, all people know is that maybe we'll go back to school, maybe, but I think that there's a collective um, holding of breath mm. of w I'm holding my breath as well. I feel like for, <laughs> for the most part, 2020 has showed me, like I started this conversation, nothing is real. I, as a planner, this has been one of the most shocking experiences of my existence. Just the fact that I could plan and it would not be achieved or not be achieved in the way in which I had planned it and I would be okay with it. Like, for me, the idea that urgency is real is very questionable now. Like, nothing is that urgent. Like, we, we, can, we can take our time with things. Take we can live in the moment. Time, yeah. Take your time, but don't waste time. It reminds me of the yeah. Lupita Yongo. Yeah, I, I thought it was so beautiful. I literally was reading it with my... You know, yeah. um, so... I'm one of the people who have found it impossible to, not impossible, but difficult, because I don't believe that anything is impossible. Excuse me. I'm one of the people who found it um, difficult to plan. So I, I don't know the outlook of the future, mm. and I don't want to speculate. 
But I hope it's a thank you for being thing. vulnerable because everybody's given us answers, 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 answers. This, this is what you should be doing for your business, for your life, and the next, you know, so-called. But yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. And I also, I'm one of the people who really, really, I think I don't know is one of the best answers. <laughs> like I don't that's, know. it's not, it's not. <laughs> it's honest. <laughs> it's, it's honest, honest. really. It's I don't honest. tolerate it with work, especially if someone has to do work for me, and I it's don't know, like, like go and find out. Go and find out. But it's also a kind of honesty that is very insular. I don't know the outlook of the future. I don't know what will happen in the next two weeks, in the next three weeks, especially with all the things that are up in the air. Um, all the right? And I also think that the U.S. election has, um, and also the elections that are forthcoming, the Ghanaian no, election, no. Elect, so it's, it's a lot of tentative things hanging, but I'm looking forward to healing. I think I think it's been a very brutal year. Yeah, so I, I think I'm looking forward to healing. I think that's what I'm looking forward to. And I I get the sense that there are people who feel the pressure to overcorrect. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing people sort of swing back and forth between the pendulum of I've been at home for six months. I'm gonna drink all the liquor and go to all the parties and go to and I'm like healing is a process. Take it it's easy. a process. Take it easy because you will swing right back yeah. into the space of. Because this, like I said, we were having a neurological event. Yeah. It's very interesting that I'm thinking about that. Yeah, that's it. It's a neurological event. And so what's happening, it's... Everyone, everyone has to heal. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You're like, we are literally in, in the midst of, of a massive neurological shift. And if you know anything about brain science, which is not like most people are brain scientists mm. um, the the brain is a very interesting thing yeah. I, I, I think that I think that what people should be with I think what people what should sit with people is that they're allowed to heal and they're allowed to heal in and take it easy on your own time right? because a lot is being normalized the airports are open everything is throwing you know you it's know, coming back yeah you have to also remember that you spent four months of large uncertainty large pockets of uncertainty and i don't think people are really prepared for the culture the culture shock that they were going to get when they start going back out when i so i came to, during my master's degree i came to work in ghana for eight months and when i went back to new york city i fell off it happens i didn't you know, the slowness that I had kind of had, had mm -hmm. become accustomed to. I, yeah. I drove everywhere in Accra. Then all of a sudden I was in the street and there were people around me all the so time. Bad. I had to be on the subway. I had I to agree. touch. It was, I actually could not even stand on the subway. I felt anxious. I didn't, I was like, why are people standing so close to me? Why are there so thing. many people? It's a real thing. And I think we have to be willing to say, okay, like, I can ease back into life. Yeah. I don't have to by force, by force, be out, out. Yeah. Because... What you're doing is you're piling on. Like I said, it's a neurological event. So you're having this neurological event and you're pushing sort of like your brain science into a direction that it's not ready to go. And you start piling and piling and piling and piling and piling on. I, I think so. I think people should take it easy on themselves. Allow themselves healing. One of my dear friends, um, Bassie, she says, allow, allow yourself mourning. Like just literally allow, allow, allow yourself. And it's going to seem impossible because of all the pressures that exist, work pressure, financial pressure. A lot of people who have been out of work for months, they yeah. would feel the need to, you know, push themselves, try to make up for lost time. Pressure is not real. The thing that is real is that you are alive. Nothing is real. Literally, <laughs> nothing <laughs> is real. Pressure, pressure is, is not real. real. Take your time. time is into it. Time is also not real. The only thing that is real is being alive. Every other thing is secondary. secondary. And, and if, you're, if you're alive and you have breath, take, take care of that. Trying. Your business try, is just trying. Just try. Try to take care of that. Try to prioritize that. Try to think about that first. It's very easy for us to be very, very difficult and um, tough and mean to ourselves. We are our greatest critics. Gosh, we, we lack so much empathy for ourselves. We, I had to write this morning because this morning has been a vulnerability storm for me. Every day has presented yeah. its own version of challenge, good challenge, the kind of challenge that when you rise to it, you're like, you that was, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, um, 
I read an article, finished an article, it was an op-ed. Mm -hmm. I only do op-eds because I, <laughs> I am, I'm not that much of an investigator. <laughs> this is how I feel. That's fine. You know, like, so um, I wrote, wrote an op-ed for like a, an actual like news agency and I had to, I was writing it for an editor who is like a veteran, I'm sending it to veterans news people. Okay. Thank you. So my initial, and my deadline was Tuesday and I asked for an extension. You asked for extension? <laughs> I'm surprised. That's you. That's how I felt. How you? And it took so much to ask for that because he had messaged me and asked, is Tuesday good? I was like, yes, sir, Tuesday. And I was like, Speaking of which, I have a deadline for October 14th, so I hope that you will encourage me to not ask for an extension. <laughs> As an extension, yeah. I still worked on it. I got it in Wednesday morning at 6 a.m., but I felt the pressure to, I felt, you know, so that was the vulnerability of asking for what you need. Like, asking for what you need, not seeing yourself as height maintenance. But finally being able to come to terms to say, let me ask for what I need in this moment. Mm -hmm. Once I asked for an extension, somehow the pressure was lifted off yeah. that when I looked at my shittiest first draft, I was like, oh, this is just a structure thing, right? Because you had all the thoughts. Now it's a rearrangement thing. Yeah. It went from rearrangement, okay, verb here, noun there. You know, but that's also pressure you recognize because that work there. is going to be edited profoundly by profoundly. experienced editors. So I'm not even done <laughs> about the vulnerability shit storm that I was a part of. Mm -hmm. I send it in, I'm like, eh, 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 eh. you know, lead editor says, Oh, great, it looks really good. Then I see that somebody else had asked for it in uh, access. Uh, access to the Google Doc. I'm like, The track changes on that. I was like, for the first thing I said when I saw it, I was, I was like, oh, hell no, like verbatim. Then I read it and I was like, yeah, yeah these are good edits. And it, actually, a lot of it was just comments. At the end, he was like, this is so beautifully written. And I was like, after you done ripped it to faces. But then I thought about, and that was, so the first step was writing it. That was the vulnerability. Yeah. The next step was allowing someone to sort of, you know, because I'm an artist, I'm sensitive exactly. about my shit. Exactly, that's what I was going to say. Most of the work that we do is just bringing ourselves, like, our most vulnerable moment, getting naked. Oh, my God. This that is, it. is another vulnerability, vulnerable moment that I had to negotiate with myself because I was like, am I prepared enough? I'm talking to Casey. He loves structure. He's a writer. He's a serious writer. He's serious. I need to be serious. <laughs> am I serious enough? I've been out of commission. Can I do this? Oh. Is this me? I got this. Outfit. Hair. Makeup, um, is this good? I might chair so much. <laughs> Guys, is my production assistant this? I was working with so many pieces and I've been out of commission for so long that coming back to this. You showed up. At the end of the day, I that's had no choice. It's literally. Home. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, you had a choice. You had a choice to cancel. You had a choice to call mm. me and tell me, Casey, you know, I got a cold. Oh, I think I'm exposed to Corona. You know, you had yeah. you had a choice, but you showed up, and that's what I'm, that's literally all that matters. All and the I'm time. not even done. Tomorrow, mm -hmm. I have I have I'm working on something like an editorial shoot, that's good. and I'm not for the first time. I'm doing something that I didn't con I didn't control all the creative elements of it. Uh, I didn't choose the creative that I'm, I'm doing it for a publication. So they've chosen the creative director. They've chosen the location. We're shooting. Two and a half, three hours outside of Accra. All you have to do is what? Show up. And that's what you're going to do. And that's enough. And most times, literally, most times, that's all you have to show up mm. for yourself. That's important to you. There's a reason you said yes to doing the work tomorrow. The whole week. And I realized that all my feelings of like anxiety and vulnerability has been okay. working up to tomorrow, which is the last day of the week, working up to this moment where it, if of all moments of the entire week, I have the least control of, or at least I feel, I have the least certainty of. Yeah, but you know, nothing is real. Nothing is real. <laughs> you cannot control anything. You don't yeah. have, we I've clueless. never had control. We are right? clueless. Look at the pandemic. Literally, it's affected, it cuts across class, cuts about race, cuts about today. gender. Yeah. It's like, we are powerless. At the end of the day, we have a kind of pseudo power, but it's, at the end of the day, it is pseudo power. The only power that you have is within yourself. Bringing yourself. Bring yourself to the table. 
remind yourself of why you're loved. Remind yourself that you're loved. Remind yourself of the things that are important. Just, it's you. You exist. You exist. You matter. You're important. So you show up. You bring, you bring yourself to the table. You, you. It starts with you. It ends with you. Just do it. There's no, if you can't do it, do it now. Like, there's no point wait, waiting. Yeah. It's like, you know, I feel like when this pandemic started, we all thought that, hey, two months will be over. Three months, we're literally still I, living. You know, I feel, you know what? We were supposed to go on the trip in July. We were still planning it. Like, okay, yeah. so March, I'm sure by July, we're yeah. going to make it to Croatia. Yeah. It's all good. And yeah. it was like, zoop. No, just, just, just do it. Do what you have to do. Time, nothing waits, waits for you. We are in a, we are in a process of constant moving awesome. nothing, stops. nothing stops so just do it take that take that job take that tell that person you love them Wix being vulnerable write just that do it. shitty ass poem like if you think you're a bad you know writer, exactly we all poem. we all have, i have i wrote very terrible terrible poems when i was younger but the thing is that it teaches you right do it right it. if it's if it's terrible write it if it's good write it just do it do what you want to do. Do what makes you happy. Live in the moment. It's very important because literally nothing else is real. This moment is real. You are real. Coexist in that. Like live in that reality that you're real and the moment is real. And Isn't it crazy that on, the, on sort of like the time number line, mm -hmm. like it doesn't exist? Like what do you mean? the past technically does not exist and the future does not exist. Exactly. Like, it's, it, when you look at it, Prince is looking at us. So Prince who shoots and edits is a physics, he studied physics. So like, you get it, right? Um, literally only this, this tangible moment. It's like, we're going through like literally one second ago does not exist. One second in the future doesn't, doesn't exist. exist. This is real. This is real. Now is real. This like, do it. Conversation is real. <laughs> this conversation is real. Yes. Right? Yes. Thank you so much. I feel so refreshed. I do as well. I feel like we would be making this a thing. In the Let's future. make this a thing. Should we have someone else? <laughs> no. I think we need a couple more people, yes. but let's absolutely make this a thing. Yes. We can do this we anytime. Have the dinner. Best we do. You're yeah. like, my <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, Thank you, Casey. All right, folks. Well, if you like this conversation, go ahead and liked it. I mean, you actually watched the entire conversation, which means you probably really enjoy this content. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you can get more content from me and you can know whenever conversations like this and my recipes and all of the content drops. Now, also make sure you go ahead and visit nanakunama.com. That's where all the fun goes down. Leave a comment when we post this. There'll be a whole blog and discussion that you can join. Thank you once again and see you next time.